delicious food. Everything about this was um, wonderful. All right, so Sam did that with George and that.
is in the house, he asked them, what are you arguing about on the way? But they were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another who was the greatest. He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a little child and put it among them, and taking it in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but he who sent me. The word of God for the people. The child. When Jesus looked at those disciples and he said, Who is the least of these? They were arguing with each other about who was the proudest, who was the best. But he said, Welcome to the child. children as the least of these. They don't control the money. They don't control power. But they have a voice that we need to honor and recognize. In both of the passages this morning, from the Matthew passage and the Mark passage, Jesus tells us, you know, to be like children in our faith and in our understanding and in our belief. So I wanted to tell you a couple of stories this morning about children and the impact that they've had on my life and my faith. To let you see just a glimpse of what those children can bring to us particularly the joy that they share in the world around them. Some of you know that I was a camp counselor for many, many years, about 10 summers in all, at a United Methodist camp on the eastern shore of Maryland called Camp Tacoma. And during one of those summers, we had a little boy who was about eight, who didn't want to do the program that was before him. He didn't want to go to Bible study and sit in the dark chapel. And instead of getting upset or angry with him, one of my co-counselors said, okay, what would you like to do right now instead? And so they went outside and sat behind, beside a tree and looked at ants. He was absolutely fascinated by the ants and the colony that they had created. So he sat there for about two hours watching the ants and everything that they were doing and how they were working together. And during that time, he was also talking to my friend about everything that he had seen, everything that he was observing. And as we sat there, and we could also hear some of what he was saying in the other places where we were around camp, but he taught us the joy of being present in that moment and watching everything that was going on around you, even the tiniest of God's creations, and to appreciate how they worked together in the community and were helping one another. And so often my friend and I still think about that little boy, and that was almost 30 years ago. But he had all that joy of wonder and awe of God's creation. We 
often had um, services. We had a chapel that sat right on the water. And so we had evening worship services, an evening vesper service that involved singing and scripture and, and Bible and a little bit of, of, of a message. And in the, on Thursday evenings, which was our last evening of camp, we had a special service that was called a Galilean service. And we had, we had um, candles on a pie plate that we would then light and send our light and Christ's light into the world across the river. And this was always a very, very powerful and meaningful service for the kids. It involved a lot of music, including some of the songs that I picked today, like this little light of mine. And often the kids, after hearing all of these wonderful words of worship, of singing and the story of Jesus sending light out into the world, they would often talk with us as their counselors and their cabin mates about what a powerful and meaningful week at camp it had been. And they were often in tears because they didn't want to go home. No. They had experienced such love and grace among their fellow cabin mates and around the, just the being out in the natural world and seeing everything that God had created that they weren't ready to leave because it was a mountaintop experience for them. But the, there, there was one particular group of kids I would love to tell you about this morning. So every week, Sunday afternoon, you get a new kids group of kids coming into camp. And as a counselor, you had to figure out how they could work together for that week and to become a family. <clears throat> And we had a girls' cabin paired with a boys' cabin, and we did all of our activities together throughout the week, except for our sleeping, and then we went back to our separate cabins to sleep. And in this particular instance, I had a group of senior high kids, so high schoolers, who some wanted to be at camp, and some didn't want to be there at all. We had some kids from Wilmington, Delaware, which was a very urban city. Then we had some kids from very rural, small towns on the eastern shore of Maryland that were right on size of some of these towns in Vermont, so very small towns. So that Sunday afternoon, the girls were already fighting. We hadn't been at camp for very long, and they were already fighting with each other. They couldn't find a common ground. <coughs> And then we went and we met the boys' cabin. And the boys started fighting with the girls. And my co-counselor and I just looked at each other and we were like, oh no. What are we going to do? How is this going to work for the week? And so we sat and we thought, we said a whole lot of silent prayers at that moment in time because we said, oh, this is going to be an awful And then we also took some risks and some chances. One of the opportunities that the campers were allowed to do um, at that camp was we had a pier that stretched out into the water and looked over the water and had a little gazebo. And we said, why don't we sleep out under the stars at the gazebo? And so we did. And in that night of being on the pier, and just hearing one another's stories about where they had come from, the things that scared them, their hopes and their dreams. We learned a lot about each other that night. And you know, all that little bickering that had happened in those first two days of camp started to settle down. And then they started to ask each other's opinions about things. They started to wonder how somebody else would think about something that was happening. They started to give each other a chance. And so then each day, it got better. When we got to that service on Thursday night, there was much weeping. And there was much hand-holding. 
And the next day, they have another closing worship service and more tears. And when they left one another, there were giant hugs. So this group of teenagers taught me about chances and taking risks and relying on God to help you in the midst of life. It's always so hard to pick which other stories to tell and what parts to share. And so I, the next one that I'll talk about is my friend Roland. <coughs> When I was 10, and at our area elementary school, uh, my friends and I were out in the playground at recess one afternoon, and there were new people there on the playground touring our school that day. Um, we had had a school for children with special needs that was closing down, and those children were transitioning into the public elementary school, into a special wing of the school. And so I met Roland that day as his teacher carried him around. Roland was born without arms past his elbow and legs past his knees. And he was nonverbal. And so when his teacher introduced him to my friends and I, he said, you know, this is Roland, he's about your age. And she continued to tell us some other things about Roland and said, the doctors don't expect him to live past his 13th birthday because of all of his medical issues. I was profoundly impacted by that conversation that day. And as we were fourth graders, we left that school to go into middle school. So I didn't see Roland or any of the other kids that I met that day. Because we went on to a new school. But several years later, we had a countywide art show at the high school where works of art were displayed of students from across our county. And I was walking around and I looked up and there was a painting by Roland. He painted with his elbows. So then every year after that, while I was in high school, I would look for a painting that Roland had made, and there would be one in the art show. But I didn't see Roland, because he wasn't at the exhibit that evening. But I would still think about him and wonder what was going on. Many years passed. My mother started to work with, for a group in our community um, that did day programming for adults with special needs. And she said one day when I was home on vacation, why don't you come in to work with me? So I came in to work. And guess who I saw? Roland. At this point in time, we're in our 30s. So he's lived well past that age of expectation that the doctors had for him. And come to find out, Roland's mom was the receptionist at the day program. So I got to meet her as well. And so over the next several years when I would go home, I would visit my mom at work. And I would visit Roland as well as some other <coughs> friends that I had gone to school with over the years. But always amazed by the gift that Roland gave me of the beauty and the power of art in the least and unexpected. 
back and I ask my friends that were with me that day, and nobody else remembers meeting Roland. So why did that one instance have such a profound impact on me and not anybody else? So sometimes it's just that brief moment of awareness, the brief moment of an interaction with somebody that can change your life forever. And then I think I'll do one more this morning. Um, I was a special ed paraprofessional in a public school setting with fifth graders over in Plainfield, New Hampshire before my children were born. And I think I will share a story about my friend Lily. Lily had extreme medical needs in addition to cognitive delays. And the year that I worked with her, she was wheelchair bound because she had just had back surgery. And she was about 10 years old at the time. And often, we were not in the classroom with her peers, so she and I did a lot of one-on-one -on -one work together. And she loved to paint in watercolors, but she loved poetry. And she would share poems that she had written. And she would share her artwork. She was a watercolor painter. And we would read stories together. And at that time, she really enjoyed the magic tree house stories. And so we spent a lot of time together. And during the time that we were working together, she was always patient and kind and understanding, even when I couldn't understand what she was saying to me. Because sometimes she was difficult to understand especially when she was excited about what she was trying to share. And then there was this day that we were in our science class, and the teacher spent a lot of that year talking about physics and doing experiments so that the kids could understand what physics was all about. And his famous experiment if you talk to any kid that ever had one over the years, it was, oh my gosh, this was my favorite experiment that Mr. Paul did. And so there was a long hallway in the school, much like this aisle here at church. And he would tell kids that they could be propelled down that hallway using pencils and a desk. And they just looked at him. And then he goes, would you like to see it? And so then we'd all march out into the hallway, and he would line the entire hallway with pencils. And then he would put the desk, he'd turn it upside down so the flat side of the desk was on top of the pencils, and then he'd ask the first kid, get in. And then he would push them. And the look of excitement and awe that was on every kid's face. And then Mr. Paul turned to me and said, how can Lily do this experiment? And I said, let me watch a few rounds because we need to figure out what was going to be safe for her. And so we watched a couple times, and then I said, okay, we can do some modifications to make that desk, which was like a car, a little bit safer, and why don't we get a helmet just to make sure everything would be okay. And so Lily got a turn sailing across those pencils on that desk her eyes, and that smile that went from ear to ear. And so from Lily, I learned many, many life lessons, but I learned about the joy of trying something new, and how sometimes we have to figure things out a little bit first, that we can't just jump into it right away. But you know, we have to be patient and figure it out. But then, how awesome it is when we do something new. Welcome the child in your life. Give them a chance to share their world with you. The lessons that they can teach you.
91, Jesus loves me.
unto thy service. Let them be used where you are guiding us to do your holy work. In your name we pray. Amen. What are our prayers this morning, our joys and our concerns? Well, the, the big deal is the new season. God's given us a new season, and let it be blessed for, for all of us. He has his son on his earth, the way he should just so, and he's the one that's given to us this, 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 this autumn season. So we should thank him and praise him for that. It's only because he provides it that uh, we have it. And he's going to keep it, you know, uh, in providence. He's going he's to he's keep it just right for us. <laughs> Here in South Carolina, all over the world. As we were talking about trials, when I was out in Montana, I visited my niece. I hadn't seen her in 20 years. She's a ward in the state of Montana. And um, no one's been in contact with her, but the joy that she felt when I finally visited her, she had finally someone to come and visit her. It was just amazing, and she's very happy. Um, she works and she bowls to get ready for the Special Olympics and uh, she showed us her bedroom to go out shopping and stuff and it was just such a delightful day to see her. And she hadn't had any company for probably 17 years. So her sister and I finally made the trip down to see her and it was wonderful too.
Thank you.